Happy birthday to Papa Stone. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter number 14. All right, I am on 1 Kings chapter 14. And if you found your place there and you're able to, will you stand with me as we read our text this evening? 1 Kings chapter number 14, beginning in verse number 21. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and 1 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nama, an Ammonitess. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. It came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all, and he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields, and committed them unto the hands of the chief of the guard, which kept the door of the king's house. It was so when the king went into the house of the Lord that the guard bare them, and brought them back into the guard chamber. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam, and all that he did... Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naamah, an Ammonitess. And Abijam, his son, reigned in his stead. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. Lord, we're thankful. To be able to be in your house. We're thankful to have the freedom of worship. We're thankful that you have recorded for us the lives of people that have gone before us. So that we could learn. Lord, it's not things that we can just pull out and suppose. These are lessons that you very plainly put in your word for us. You've done that so that we'll not make those mistakes. And so that we can have your blessings on us uh, as an individual, uh, on a national level, and even in our generation. And so, Lord, I pray that You'll show us exactly what you would have for us to learn tonight. Let me be your instrument that you'll use, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Of course, we're uh, starting or continuing on uh, in our study of the divided kingdom. And as you can tell, we're on part four and we're going to go back to Rehoboam. Um, and the reason is, is we saw the origin of this kingdom and this division. We have seen Jeroboam's part. We have seen Rehoboam's part. But I want to look at some specifics uh, about Rehoboam. And uh, really, this division that has taken place in this kingdom uh, is based upon several foolish decisions that had been made. This once great kingdom of Israel is divided and they find two fools sitting on the thrones there. And that's never a good thing. When you got, when you got fools running the affairs of state, that's never good. 
And uh, it never has been good and it never will be good. That's part of the reason that we need to take uh, deliberate, we need to make a deliberate choice as we exercise uh, our right to vote because we never want a fool uh, sitting in the White House. We never want a fool sitting in the Senate. We never want a fool sitting in the House of Representatives because it affects all of us. And here in the divided kingdom, uh, we've seen the northern kingdom of Israel. We see the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, and they've got fools sitting on both thrones. And it's not good. Uh, Jeroboam is sitting uh, on the throne in the northern kingdom. Uh, and, uh, and we've got another slide here. Uh, I'm sorry there. I kind of threw uh, something there. I've, I've, I've uh, produced this chart here so that we can see uh, how long each king has sat on the throne and uh, how they relate one to another. Uh, in Jeroboam, in the uh, northern kingdom, we know him to be that man that wasted a, a great opportunity uh, that God had given him. God wanted him to be great. Uh, God gave him everything at his disposal so he could be a great king. God wanted him to be like David. Uh, but he turned out to be a fool and he's going to sit on the throne for 22 years. Understand a nation now uh, has a foolish ruler for 22 years. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon who is going to reign over Judah, is also a fool, and he is going to be sitting on his throne for 17 years. And in our text this evening, we see exactly what kind of reign Rehoboam had. I want you to notice uh, in verse number 22 here, in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 22, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord... Uh, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. Uh, they're in bad spot. And they're making some pretty stupid decisions uh, as they go along. And, and we see that high places are built. And, and these high places are, are places that were constructed to offer sacrifices to false gods. Uh, they consisted of an altar. Uh, they also consisted of an elaborate sanctuary to where they uh, uh, sacrificed to these idols. And, and these high places littered the countryside. And, and, and uh, this is a big no-no. It's a huge no-no. Before Israel ever went in to possess that land that God had promised them, uh, God uh, had given them uh, some instructions, some commandments. Uh, I want you to uh, look at the next slide here. Uh, I have uh, put down Numbers chapter 33 verses 51 through 53. This is the instruction that God had given. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quite pluck down all their high places. They were told when you go into the land and you see those high places, pluck them down, destroy them, and ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein. For I have given you the land to possess it. A few verses down in verse 55, God gives them a promise. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. God put... God took this very seriously. 
And he says these high places and these idols and these false uh, images that these uh, heathen uh, that are in the land right now, uh, you've got to remove those. You've got to cleanse the land. When I give you this land, uh, cleanse that land. Uh, and now uh, here in Rehoboam's day, uh, they begin to reconstruct the very things that God uh, had told them vehemently to destroy. Verse 22 speaks of these images that were worshipped. Groves on every hill and under every green tree. And the groves were also places of worship that were associated with Baal worship. Now in, in verse number 24, we also read about the Sodom and Sodomites uh, in the land. Uh, it, for the very first time, uh, we see this inside the kingdom of Israel. Um, and they were all too familiar, no doubt, with the judgment that this brings. Uh, one thing about the children of Israel, they liked history. They were proud of their history. And no doubt, they all remembered what happened when the Sodomites, uh, to the Sodomites in the days of Abraham. They remember Sodom. They remember Gomorrah. They remembered uh, how God responded to this abomination unto this sin. But now they've changed. And it seems to that this sin is now introduced into this nation for what appears to be the first time uh, as, since they've become a nation. And so I, I'm looking at the situation the condition here uh, in Israel, you've got two fools sitting on two thrones, you've got two kingdoms, and there's been a drastic change that has taken place among the chosen people of Israel. Idolatry and sin have become normal for them. Let me point out a key piece of information that will help to explain this, uh, especially uh, here in the southern kingdom. Verse number 21. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah, an Ammonitess. Now, that last part is very key here. Rehoboam's mother was not an Israelite. She was not a child of Israel. She was from Ammon. She was one of the wives that Solomon took from the heathen nations that surrounded them. And there's a lesson to learn from here. Uh, one of those lessons is a lot of this goes back to Solomon in the foolish decisions that he had made. He should have never taken those wives. Uh, and we had concentrated in the very first part of this study uh, how Solomon uh, had turned to idolatry in his latter years because of his wives. He should have never had those wives. He should have uh, never come in unto them. He should, she should, he should have never married them. He should have never had children from them. Uh, and this is a major problem that is showing its head again several years later. When Rehoboam becomes a fool, uh, it's not the case of a young man being thrust into the leadership position after the death of his father and he's simply not ready that's not the problem here the problem is that he's under two different influences he's under the influence of solomon and under the influence of his mother and he chose the influence of his mother who was an idolatrous and uh, he has embraced those things he's not a young man He's not a young man that just didn't know any better. He knew better. Verse 21 tells us that he had, uh, was 41 years old when he takes the throne. So by simply just doing simple math, 
is Solomon reigned for 40 years. And Rehoboam was 41 years when he took the throne. That tells me that he was alive for the entire time that his dad ruled. So he had been witness to the good times and the bad times. He had uh, lived during the time when God had blessed Israel, when God had blessed his father, uh, and he had also seen the results of what happens when his dad turned his back on God. And when his dad began to experience all of these things and how God took his hand of blessing off of him. He has uh, lived through all of that. He knows what has gone on. And in spite of that knowledge, he decides that he is going to take on the characteristics that his dad showed and revealed in his latter years. And probably because of the influence of his mother. Uh, Rehoboam is a man that was raised under two different influences. Solomon's wisdom and Naamah's idolatry. And this is exactly why God forbid the children of Israel to take wives uh, from around them. Uh, I want you to uh, hold your place here. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 3 and verse 4. God said way back when, way back in the beginning. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me that they may serve other gods, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. This was the Old Testament law uh, that was applied to the children of Israel. But you know the same principle is passed down to the New Testament Christian as well. I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. It is said, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? The verses of scripture we read in Deuteronomy. Uh, that was Old Testament law that was applied to the children of Israel. But this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 applies to believers. Uh, but instead of it applying to marriages between nationalities, it applies to marriages between the saved and the unsaved. Why is that? Because you're, uh, you've got two different influences there. Uh, you don't see eye to eye. You don't see eye to eye about life, about eternity, about a lot of different things. And I, I, I understand that uh, before, uh, sometimes two unsaved people get married uh, and one gets saved, the other doesn't get saved. They always run into problems. And there, you, you just can't really prevent that situation from happening. But if you're a saved man or a saved woman, and you begin to uh, court somebody of the opposite sex who is unsaved, uh, understand that while love covers all things in the beginning, it doesn't in the end. You're going to have problems. Well, preacher, I'm going to change them. I'm going to change her. It doesn't really happen that way, does it? Pastor, you don't understand. 
Everything's good. It's not going to happen to us. We're in love. I know you in love. And you're going to be in love in five years, but you're going to be arguing about this thing. Because you're going to want to be dedicated to serving Christ and your spouse is going to be dedicated in not serving Christ. And this will become an issue between you. And then on top of that, uh, you bring children into the equation. Uh, and now you have children uh, whose loyalties and allegiances are being pulled in two different directions. Uh, and it never ends well. Rehoboam is in this situation. He's a child that is come from an unequally yoked relationship. And uh, when he is older and when he is grown, uh, instead of uh, embracing the religion of Solomon and the religion of his people, uh, uh, he has embraced uh, the idolatry of his mother uh, who is not an Israelite. And it's not just Rehoboam that suffers. It is a nation that is going to suffer because of this. Their leadership is going to be terrible uh, and they're going to go into a bad direction. And these bad results are evident in the life of Rehoboam. Now, Jeroboam, his counterpart, is always known as a man who wasted the great opportunity that God gave him but Rehoboam, his story is not of a man who wasted great opportunities. He is known for constantly making the foolish choice. That's what we get from Rehoboam. He's a man that you give him a choice, he's going to make the wrong choice every single time. It was evident in the beginning of his reign, all the way back in uh, chapter number 12, or uh, yeah, chapter number 12. You'll remember uh, they called him to Shechem to make him king. And the children of Israel came and said, hey, would you make our burden lighter? And if you'll do that, we'll uh, serve you all the days of our lives. And remember, he took advice from two different groups of people. And he chose the wrong advice. Amen. He chose the advice of the younger men that grew up with him. Right. And when that happened, he divided a nation. He split a nation. And now, here in chapter number 14, he stands at another crossroads. He is standing between the ways of Solomon and the ways of his idolatrous mother. And he'll make the foolish choice again. This is a man that can't help himself. Just making a dumb choice, one right after another. And uh, as you study his life, you're going to see, uh, I can't pull off a good choice that he made his entire life that we know about in Scripture. Every time he is given a choice, he makes the foolish choice. And when you make a foolish choice, you suffer harsh consequences. Now, uh, I'm, I'm just going to get into a little preaching here. Uh, and this is not just for our young people. It's for us old people too. Don't think that you can make a choice and choose the consequences that are going to come as a result of that choice. You don't get to choose that. You make the choice and God says, this is the consequence you're going to suffer. Well, I don't like that consequence. Well, you shouldn't have made the choice. Shouldn't have made the choice. And again, a little preaching here. Um... Uh, every once in a while, something will happen and uh, everybody starts thinking about abortion and talking about abortion and all of that. And you always have somebody standing on the street with a sign that says, uh, a woman's right to choose. You got a right to choose, but you made that choice before you took your clothes off. That's when you made your choice. But what's happening is I want to choose my consequence. 
No, you can't choose your consequence. You made a choice. You've got to live with the consequence. And, well, I can choose to kill this baby. You can choose that. That brings another consequence. And God is not going to stand by idle with that. And, he, and, and we're a nation that has put our head in the sand uh, on this issue a lot of times. Uh, and God has taken His hand of blessing off of us as a nation. And that's one of the reasons why. Rehoboam is a man that just makes foolish choices. And there are some consequences to foolish choices. Let me just give you a few points here on the consequences of choosing foolishly. Number one, there comes chastisement. That is one of the consequences of the foolish choice. I want you to look at, uh, go back to uh, 1 Kings chapter number 14. I want you to look at verse 25. There's chastisement. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. Now, who remembers how long Rehoboam sat on the throne? 17 years. Okay, 17 years. He's only in his fifth year. And God's already, God's already chastening him. How's he chastening him? By bringing Egypt into attack. Now, if you know anything about history during this time, Egypt was a very strong dynasty. You didn't want Egypt coming after you. And Egypt came in that fifth year. And understand that this type of invasion has not happened to Israel in a lot of years. In fact, since the time that David made Jerusalem his capital, the walls of Jerusalem had never been breached. This was a strong city. But now God's going to send the Egyptian army to deal with Rehoboam. What do you mean God's going to send him? Well, you know, you've got to get the rest of the story. So I want you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 12. In 2 Chronicles chapter 12, we're going to read another account of the same thing, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord with 1,200 chariots, and threescore thousand horsemen, and the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt, the Lubians, the Sukims, and the Ethiopians. And he took the fence cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Then came Shemaiah, the prophet to Rehoboam, and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, ye have trans You have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. And my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service, 
and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made, instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard and kept the enter- that kept the entrance of the king's house. And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them and brought them again into the guard chamber. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him that he would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judah, things went well. So uh, we see here in 2 Chronicles chapter 12, there's a reason that Egypt has now come and attacked. And they're very clear to us. They forsook the law of God in verse 1. They transgressed against the Lord uh, in verse 2. In verses 3 and 4, we're told the king of Egypt will sweep through the kingdom, taking uh, the fenced cities that Rehoboam uh, had constructed just a chapter before. Those fenced cities were there uh, as a boundary between them and Jerusalem. And Egypt wiped through them like nothing. They were supposed to prevent an invasion. But no matter how much Rehoboam prepared for an invasion, it would never be enough to stand up against the chastisement of God. Just wasn't going to happen. So it happens uh, in an instant. And this has got to be a lesson to every one of us. God has given us the same conditional promises that He had given to Solomon, to Jeroboam, to Rehoboam. If we'll do right, God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to help you. But if not, there's some consequences that you're going to have to suffer. Hebrews chapter 12 speaks at great length about the chastening hand of God. And we would do ourselves good to read it and consider it before we start making foolish decisions. Your decisions should be bathed in prayer. They shouldn't be haphazard. Our decisions should be made uh, with the consideration that is this going to please God or am I deciding this so that I can please my flesh? When we start to think on a spiritual plane, our decisions are going to become a little bit different. And especially if we think, if I'm doing this against the will of God, I am inviting chastisement into my life. Rehoboam is a man that constantly makes foolish choices. And it leads to chastisement. Number two, I see fear. Uh, In 2 Chronicles, we're there, chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. Then came Shemaiah the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together, uh, uh, that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, You have forsaken me. And therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak, whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah again, saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. There is great fear. And I can understand the fear. You wake up one day, you look out over the walls, and you see a whole lot of dudes out there with swords and spears and chariots. And it ain't the Avon lady calling. It's Egypt. And they're scared. They're absolutely terrified. And of course, that fear is compounded when God sends His man. 
and says, it's over with. Because you've forsaken me. You transgressed my law. You have built high places. You have worshipped idols. And now you're going to suffer. Of course they were feared. Have you ever wondered why they didn't listen before? No doubt. There had been other men that had come and said, Hey, what are you all doing? What are you doing? The prophet that pronounced judgment on Jeroboam, uh, Ahijah, and we had looked at him a, a couple weeks ago. In all probability, he is no longer living in Shiloh. He is now living there in Judah. Because Jeroboam had cast out all the priests and all the Levites. And they had gone down to the southern kingdom. No doubt, there was a preacher there. Shemaiah, probably not the first time that he had come. But they just never listened. Rehoboam and the princes of Judah refused to listen until trouble came. And when trouble came... They wanted to get out of it. But you know what? It's too late to avoid trouble. And this time when the man of God comes and says, Hey, you got trouble. They listen. You know why they listen? They're looking over the wall and they're seeing a whole lot of people out there. And they humbled themselves. Why did they humble themselves? Because they're afraid. And by the way, humbling yourself is not the same as repentance. And when they humbled themselves, God did give them some deliverance according to verse number 7. He didn't deliver them, but He gave them some deliverance. So, when you make a bad decision and, and you constantly are repeating your mistakes, you've got chastisement to deal with. You've got fear to deal with. But you also got loss. Pick it up in verse 7. When the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made, instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hand of the chief of the guard and kept the entrance uh, of the king's house. There's chastisement, there's fear, now there's loss. They became the servants of Egypt in verse 8, and their treasure was taken in verse number 9. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. This treasure is all that stuff that Solomon had accumulated during his 40-year reign. Under Solomon, Israel had become exceedingly wealthy. They had no want. In fact, there's no poor people in Israel during the the reign of Solomon. They just had so much. It's coming out of their ears. They thought that we'll never be in want ever again. But now, just five years after the death of Solomon, it's all gone. Every bit of it's gone. They have, uh, Egypt has gone to the house of the Lord and taken all the treasures out of that. They have gone to the king's house, taken all the treasures uh, out of that. And everything that they held dear, Egypt took. You know, I've never seen anyone to forsake God like Rehoboam did in verse number one and prosper. Never seen that. But the opposite is always true. You forsake God, you got trouble. When you make a foolish spiritual decision, you've got trouble. And I've seen that all the time. 
You see, if we walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but instead we delight ourselves in the law of the Lord, uh, the Bible tells us we shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Here's the problem. Rehoboam's guilty of walking in the counsel of the ungodly. He's guilty of standing in the way of sinners. He is guilty of sitting in the seat of the scornful. He chooses not to delight himself in the law of the Lord. And so he's not going to prosper. He's not going to be like the tree planted by the rivers of water. He is going to suffer. His actions brought grave consequences and forced him to make other decisions, foolish decisions. How would he respond? Well, he's been backed into a corner. He has no choice but to respond or else be completely destroyed. So he humbles himself until trouble passed by when he should have repented. He humbled himself, not repented. And he never turned his back from his wicked ways. Why don't you look at verse 14. And he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Do you know for the remaining 12 years of his reign, he did evil. Five years into his reign, he comes to a crossroads. He comes to a defining point. He comes to a place where he has the perfect opportunity to repent, to get things settled, and to go on and live for the Lord. But all he does is humble himself. And when trouble's gone, he goes back to doing evil. You know, for 12 years... God could have used him for those 12 years. He could have been somebody great for those 12 years. But instead he chose not to. He came face to face with a perfect opportunity to change his ways, to get things right with God. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. Instead, he did exactly what was necessary to get out of trouble with no intention of turning from his wicked ways. Kind of reminds me of a lot of people that have come down that road since Rehoboam. Amen. Trouble comes, and we know exactly what to say until trouble leaves. Amen. That's right. That happens in church all the time. Yeah. Happens in families all the time. Um, my brother's an expert at this. I'm telling you, my, my brother is an expert at this. Just tell you a little story here. You, I know you probably wait for the stories. And I don't make these things up. I'm t I promise you I don't make these things up. But my brother is very much like this. He makes foolish decision after foolish decision after foolish decision. My brother had been in prison three times before he was 30. All because he made foolish decision after each. I, I just all the time. And my brother has become an expert now at crying and humbling himself just so he can get out of trouble. I remember he got out of prison that, uh, uh, the last time and uh, we opened our home up to him and his wife. And uh, they lived with us. He came to church. He made a profession of faith. At the time, I was the assistant pastor uh, of my church. And, uh, I, of course, about every other Friday, he'd get his paycheck and he'd go off. And, and he wouldn't come home for the weekend. And, you know, he'd be in, well, no telling where he was at. And, of course, it caused problems in the home. And uh, now his wife, his wife was a mean woman. I mean, she was mean. I, and she only put up for it so long. 
And uh, they'd fight all the time. And uh, eventually they would call Pastor. And, you know, Pastor just kind of got sick of it all. You know, this is going on every week. So he'd ring me in my office. He says, hey, it's your brother. You go deal with it. So this is, this is kind of how I got into some of my counseling expertise. And I learned real quick that he's faking it. And I'd go and sit down with them, ask questions, and they'd answer questions. Uh, and he'd say something and then uh, contradict himself. And I'd ask him about the contradiction. And eventually he'd back himself into a corner. And when he realized he'd back himself into a corner, he'd start crying. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've sinned against God in, in all of this. And, you know, uh, a couple times, you know, he got away with it. But after a while, I realized this is a pattern. And one time they called me, or they called Pastor, and Pastor says, you go deal with it. And I go there, and this woman got a knife after him. I mean, she's chasing him around with a big old kitchen knife. And uh, this is ministry 101, you know. And I have to talk the knife out of her and, you know, and part of me is thinking, go ahead, just stab him, stab him. But um, got the knife off and we went through the whole thing again. He backs himself into a corner, contradicting himself, starts crying. And by then I was a little bit aggravated with it. And I said, listen, you ain't fooling me. I have known you your entire life. You're faking, and this is not real at all. So just stop crying and man up and deal with this situation. He stopped just, I mean, he stopped like this. I mean, he turned off the waterworks just like a faucet. And he got mad and went chest to chest with me. I thought we, I thought we was going to throw down right there. But the gig was up. He knew that he was not going to get away with it. But you know, as absurd as that story sounds, people do that all the time. When I get in trouble, I'll, uh, I'll humble myself. I'll, I'll, I'll shed a few tears. Uh, but I have no intention uh, of ever turning from my wicked ways. God sees that. Amen. And I promise you that if there had been real repentance involved there, God probably would have spared a lot more than He did. But He humbled Himself instead of repenting. And God says, I'm going to give him some relief, but not a whole lot of relief. You know, it all comes because he made a foolish decision, which brought him to a place where he had to make another decision. And he backs it up with another foolish decision, which brings him to another place where he makes another foolish decision. And he constantly makes the wrong choice. Foolish decisions bring consequences that often bring us face to face with another decision, another opportunity to make another foolish decision. And that happens a lot. We look at these kings and we see the foolishness of many of them. But I purposely have address these messages in such a way to where we don't look at, well, what a dumb king. I want us to recognize we make the same mistakes. Amen. And we're going to face the same consequences. Amen. He's not the only one to make decisions and he's not the only one to make foolish decisions. Every one of us, me included, is subject to making a foolish decision. How do I get away from that? You better, as soon as the Spirit of God speaks to you about your choice, you better say, oh, thank you, Lord. I almost made a dumb choice. And even when doing the right thing is a hard thing to do, do the right thing. 
Because oftentimes we think, well, if I do that, people are going to think this or, or that. Don't worry about that. Just do the right thing. Do the right thing. I promise you, right now, today, if Rehoboam is thinking about his life on earth, he's probably thinking about all the dumb things that he chose to do. And he's probably thinking, I wish I had that over again. But we don't. We can just make the choice that's in front of us. Make the right one. Don't be guilty of constantly making the wrong choice. There every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, we do love you. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, I pray that you'll just bless our generation. Bless our families. Lord, please do that. Our young people. Lord, <clears throat> honestly, our generation has been tough on some of our young people because of the decisions that they're making. But oftentimes we're critical of somebody while doing the same thing. Lord, as adults, we make poor choices. Help us to make good choices, spiritual choices as adults. And teach our children how to make those choices as well. Lord, there's people in this building tonight that their next decision that they'll make could be critical for the rest of their lives. Pray that you give them wisdom. Give them direction. Lord, I pray, Father, that they'll know enough to make a spiritually informed decision. We'll be careful to thank you and praise you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.